Ramananda Sen Gupta. Our very special guest today is Dr. Amit Gupta, who's a senior advisor and at the Forum of Federation of Ottawa and uh, authority on conflict studies, security studies. He's earlier been a, a professor at the USAF War College, and he's also a visiting professor and a visiting fellow at various think tanks and strategic um, outfits across the world, including Sandia Labs and, and in India, I think ORF and CLAWS, you said, right? Last night. Yes. That's just a few of the things that he's an authority on. I could go on and on, but I think we'd rather, you know, have him talk with us today. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. I appreciate you taking time out for us. Thank you, Ramananda, for inviting me. So let's let's take it right from the top. I was just looking at your uh, the slides that you sent me on uh, the conflicts in Gaza and, and Ukraine. What do you think India's lesson should be from these two conflicts? I suspect they're two separate lessons altogether. Right. Um, first thing is they're extremely expensive wars. Mm -hmm. The Ukraine war is already 200 billion and counting. And that's not Ukrainian money. That's European money and American money. Right. The Gaza war is equally expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hamas have been firing maybe $200, $1,000 rockets. Israel's Iron Dome is $400,000 a rocket or missile. So all this is subsidized by somebody else. India in the next war will not be subsidized by anybody. Uh, the second thing is, what's very clear from both these wars is that resources matter, strategic reserves matter. And you've seen that with the way both the Russians and the Ukrainians have been running around the world looking for artillery shells. And, and India, which goes into a major war, to my mind, should be thinking about a six-month reserve of munitions. Mm -hmm. And you think about it this way. When Doklam happened, the Indian Air Force went to the Israelis and said, we need some PGMs. Right. The Israelis said, not a problem. But since it's an emergency buy, it'll cost you 150%. Wow. Okay. Yes. And then when Galwan happened, the Indian Air Force went to the French, who were equally nice and said, yes, of course, we'll give you the weaponry. But since it's an emergency purchase, it's 150%. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think India is the kind of country that can keep going to the well and paying uh, exorbitant amounts of money for it. So big strategic reserve matters because in wars, the amount of weaponry that's going to get expended is not what happened in the 65 war or the 71 war. Mm -hmm. This is good. And especially with the Chinese, because the Chinese are not putting troops on the border. They're using a lot of high tech weaponry. That's right. right? And high-tech weaponry means you can inflict damage to infrastructure, you can inflict damage to uh, personnel. So that would be the second thing. Third thing is you need to have partners who won't sanction you. So you do not want to get into a war and then find out, I can't get jet engine parts from you, or I can't get spares for uh, a tank or whatever. So if that's the case, the two people who will never sanction you are the French and the Russians. So in all the vital stuff, those are the two countries you should be looking at. Okay. And the last thing which I think is important from the Ukraine-Gaza wars is you have to be able to control the public opinion narrative or the mm -hmm. social media narrative. Right. And the Ukrainians were very good at that. See, they came across as here we are, this gallant country. And we got uh, invaded. And it was young Ukrainians. It wasn't the Ukrainian government, which would have done it very poorly. But it was young Ukrainians who just stood up and said, we're going to do this for our country. And you see the way the narrative was shaped across social media platforms. The Israelis, on the other hand, lost the narrative on Gaza because they were depending on the BBC, on the uh, New York Times, the Washington Post, MSNBC to pitch their version of the story. What they didn't understand was young people don't see all that. If you talk to young people in America, and I wrote a piece on this for the Clinton Institute in Dublin, young people look at things like TikTok, uh, Telegram, and then there's other stuff that I can't even begin to explain. They got their views on the Gaza conflict from there. 
And what you see in America is about one third of young people said, we want an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Mm -hmm. okay? And when the presidential primaries happen, in a number of states, up to 100,000 people to declare their protest against Joe Biden voted uncommitted in the Democratic primary. And this could be real trouble for Biden in the coming election. So those are the four things you have to really worry about. Uh, it's no longer I need to have, be on good terms with the New York Times correspondent. Nobody cares. Nobody reads the New York Times except for old people like me. Mm -hmm. And me. And you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't call you older. It's, uh, but young people don't get their news that way. And you've had this democratization of news. Look, the most influential part of news in the last five years was the killing of George Floyd. Of course. Right. Mm -hmm. And the story is there was this young 19 year old woman who was watching this happen. Her name is Donella Fraser. She pulled out her phone, started recording it, won a Pulitzer. And the powerful impact of that image, I don't think anybody could have written that and brought out the reaction, the visceral reaction, which they did. So those are the four things I think India has to look for in a future war. Mm -hmm. so what, you, what I'm hearing is that narrative management, perception management plays a huge role in right. any modern war. Yeah. Do you think India has been doing a, well, we haven't had that kind of conflict, but basically the kind of friction that we have with our neighbors, has that narrative been managed reasonably well? On Pakistan, yes. Because mm -hmm. if you read most of the studies that are done in the West, everybody agrees that India has a strong case. Okay. On China, no. Okay. On, on China, if you read books like Taylor, Taylor Fravel, of course, Neville Maxwell, Alistair Lamb, Lon Kavik, and John Garver, they all say that the Chinese case is stronger. And when you're talking about the 62 war. Oh, uh, the 62 war and yeah. what the events that led up right. to it. And see, Indians can bring out books on this, but they'll automatically be dismissed as biased. Absolutely. Right. So how do you reshape that narrative? And part of the thing is the Chinese started well when they set up Confucius centers around America. So I live in Alabama, within a hundred kilometer radius of my house, there are three Confucius centers in small universities, which wow. you would never okay. have heard of, like mm -hmm. Troy or Auburn. Mm -hmm. These are not exactly international universities. Mm -hmm. They have them. The Indian government is snobbish in that way. It feels that if you're going to put money in America, put it in Harvard. Okay. Right. The problem is, giving a $5 million endowment or a $10 million endowment to Harvard is inconsequential because Harvard's endowment is bigger than the annual budget of the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely rich university. So right. is Stanford, so on. So what you need is to create an Indian narrative in the 50 states because America has a 50 state foreign policy. And I've always said we should have Gandhi centers. And why? Because A, everybody in the world knows who Gandhi is. Mm -hmm. They may not know other people in India. And in those things, teach three things. One, teach Gandhian studies, peace studies, because that's completely non-controversial. Right. Two, teach Indian cooking, because every American wants to learn chicken butter masala. No, no Indian makes chicken butter masala. And the third thing that you do is teach yoga, because that's the other great thing that you can do. And you do this and show the great collection of Indian movies, which are there with the Indian Film Institute, Film mm -hmm. and TV Institute of India, so on. This stuff is like a gold mine. And you can release this and you can have people seeing what there is. And you create a constituency for India. So the issue then doesn't become the Sino-Indian border dispute because nobody understands it. It's mm -hmm. too complex. You want a simple argument like George Orwell's Animal Farm. Four legs good, two legs bad. So Indian's good, Chinese not so good. So how do you do that? And you have to think creatively of the narrative, I think. But uh, what do you think about, you know, the, the Indian government's sort of intention, if not the effort, to mobilize the diaspora in the US? Because that's apparently doing well from what I've heard here, but I don't know how much of an influence it really has. See, I think there's two things. One is the Indian diaspora. 
the older people are happy getting their photo taken with Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. They really don't know how to mobilize it beyond that to political power in the way uh, Jews in America do for Israel. You see, right. or Armenians in America have done for Armenia. Mm -hmm. They declared the Armen Armenian massacre a genocide, which the Turks didn't like. And or the way the Irish did it for uh, Northern Ireland. The Indians are not that good at doing it. There's a lot of claims out there on what the Indian American lobby did on the nuclear uh, issue. But that I don't think has been substantiated. There's been work written on this suggesting no, that was more Bush and Condoleezza Rice mm -hmm. than anything else. Uh, the other problem is Indians abroad carry their regional differences with them. Of course. Right. So I've met, in the town I live in, there's a whole bunch of people who call themselves Gujarati American. And I had a Sikh colleague who called himself a South Asian American, to which my answer was that say, Re, uh, a geographical identity mm -hmm. that is not a ethnic identity. Right. Right. So these kinds of divisions come in. And I don't think the Gujarati community in the United States would be as mobilized and enthusiastic if the prime minister was not Gujarati. Uh, they never mobilized in the same way when Manmohan Singh was the prime minister. Mm -hmm. I doubt they'll mobilize in the same way when somebody else is the prime minister. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that part is then again, what worked for uh, the Indian diaspora was when Prime Minister Modi brought out Donald Trump at that Howdy Modi function. Right. Because then the connection was made between India and the United States. Mm -hmm. And while Indians overwhelmingly vote Democratic, those numbers came down with the last election. True. They'll probably come down even further with this election. Mm -hmm. So I, I would put it this way. The, if you want the Indian diaspora to be better connected, then you have to do two things. One, you have to bring young Indians to this country. You have to open up the universities and let them do a summer course or something like this. So they get reintegrated into the culture of India. And the other thing you can do is there's a whole bunch of Indians who are retired now. Indians, as you know, don't play golf. Okay. So they're sitting at home, they're getting bored. Bring these people back. Tell them, go teach robotics in the IITs. Go teach medicine in one of the schools. And don't pay them uh, American salaries. A, they already Some of our universities money. do do that. but Some not, do, not, but not, not as many as good. I, the IITs do it. They allow you right. to come and do yes. a capsule course. But you do it across the board. Medical, uh, engineering, IT, mm -hmm. AI. All this stuff, if you bring in Indians who can train the next generation of Indians, and I'd also say train them in the global business culture. Train them in English as the language of business, because that seems to be going down rather dramatically in India. I was watching the India-Australia uh, test match at Ahmedabad, mm -hmm. and the commentator goes, India versus Australia. 75 years of friendship. I'm like, the minute you say versus, it's an adversarial relationship. Of course. Okay. Somebody needed to teach this young man English. But you need to go back to those kinds of standards. And it's not difficult to do. Mm -hmm. So, of, over the last decade or so, we've been growing increasingly sort of friendly with the Americans, which wasn't mm -hmm. there earlier. Um, and there is a lot of talk of, you know, uh, a very strong strategic relationship. But at the same time, I think there are some people who are still stuck with the Cold War mentality and who say that the Americans can't be trusted. Uh, we do a very transactional kind of a relationship, but we can't depend on them. They can. Um, how far do you think we can sort of... I, I think the first thing is America has two strategic allies, UK and Israel. Mm -hmm. With everybody else, it's transaction. So, American intelligence may or may not have bugged Angela Merkel's phone. And then when they got caught out, they tried to soften up the whole thing by saying to the Germans, well, why don't you join the Five Eyes? Right. And the Germans said, no, we're not joining the Five Eyes. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Five Eyes, they have Australia, New Zealand and Canada, all three of whom are smaller than the national capital region of Delhi. Mm -hmm. What do they bring to American intelligence is very little. But that the Five Eyes partnership on intelligence sharing 
is much better than anything India will ever get from the United States. With India, it's transactional. Right. With India, it's, there are no cultural uh, affinities. Mm -hmm. So, on the other hand, there are a lot of good things that can happen between India and uh, the US. I think there's always a demand for Indian students. So, that can keep growing. When I was a student, it was close to 20,000, 30,000. Now, I think it's over 200,000. Mm -hmm. And if you made it more uh, easy, it would probably be half a million for all you know. That is a good thing and should be encouraged. I think if you look at the 29 items in Make in India, if you leave out defense, the other 28, there's a huge scope for cooperation, education, healthcare, tourism. These are things that the Americans are good at. And these are things where India has huge opportunities and has a lot to offer the world. I mean, when I worked for the US Air Force, I saw Leh Ladakh, I saw Kerala, I saw Rajasthan. And I came away ashamed saying, you know, as somebody who was born in Delhi, I haven't seen the most beautiful parts of this country. Mm -hmm. Now, you could open that up. You could have direct flights from New York to Jaipur. Mm -hmm. You could do these kinds of things. And keep this in mind, Ramanan. The city of Amsterdam is 850,000 or 900,000 people. It gets 17 million tourists a year. India gets 11 million tourists a year. Okay. Yeah. The city of Barcelona is 3 million people. They get 20 million tourists a year. Good Lord. Okay. Right. And France, I think, gets 65 million tourists a year. Mm -hmm. Why does a country like India, which has so much to offer, get less than Amsterdam, which is basically known for being an entertainment center, if I may put it that way. And the thing is, you're not building on what can generate a better relationship, closer ties, so on. Well, one of the big things that's happening now in the West is people are buying retirement homes around the world. Right. In Vietnam, in Turkey, why not in India? Okay. See? And a American retirement community in India is a community that is pro-India. Absolutely, of so, course. So I, I, I believe think small, but lay the foundation and also have a 50 state foreign policy. If you look at most states in America, they have a Department of International Trade. Mm -hmm. California has an office in China and has an office in Taiwan. Okay, so they're really conducting their own foreign policy. Attract some of these people. Find out which states you want to put people in. And I think that becomes the way to shape your relationship with the United States. And don't get too excited about defense and aircraft engines and all this other stuff. Okay, but you know, since you, you're saying not only not to get too excited about it. Yes. Um, what do you really think about this Atmanirbhar thing that we're doing as far as defense goes? Given that, you know, um, I think one of your slides I saw that, you know, there's no reason for us to actually reinvent the wheel. We should be able to get work. What is your view on that? Look, there are some things in which you better be Atmanirbhar and that's strategic weaponry. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to give you the tech for the Agni missiles. Nobody gave you the tech for the nuclear weapons. Right. Right. You had to make them on your own. And the services can't go and complain about that and say, uh, we worry about the quality. Right. Because it's either the Indian nuclear weapon or there's no nuclear weapon. Right. So like it or lump it. And I think that's a good thing. I think on big ticket items like fighter aircraft, tanks, you need to find an international partner who can help you develop in a timely manner and will not sanction you. Okay. These are both important things because if you're looking fifth generation, sixth generation combat aircraft, it's not going to happen in this country. Mm -hmm. That's very clear. And the third thing is on certain things. I mean, my current fixation is drones. And the, the two countries which have done wonderfully on drones are Iran and Turkey. Iran with uh, the Shahid drones. And now they've got to deal with the Russians where they're going to be making 6,000 Shahids every year in Tatarstan in Russia. Right. Okay. Go ask Hal to make even 600, which is 10%. And I think the answer would be a no. It wouldn't happen. Okay. Second one is uh, Bayraktar from uh, Turkey. 
Right. And Jalchuk Bhairaktar essentially took off the shelf components, as did the uh, Iranians, mm -hmm. and put together drones and they're selling them around the world. Of course, Bhairaktar has one more advantage. He's married Erdogan's youngest daughter. So he has entry into the corridors of power in right. Turkey. But that aside, you can do that easily in this country. And the, the Indian private sector is doing this. The idea of forges and people like that. They're making those drones. And the biggest killers in Ukraine were the first person view drones. Now you can make bigger drones, make them at home. The Predator, which you're just buying from America, is an expensive big drone. Very expensive, right? yes. But you can make smaller drones. The Russians can help you with that. Uh, I would say both the South Africans and the Brazilians would tie up in a partnership. And if you had a good streamlined thought process on this, three services buying a common drone, much as in the way three services bought the Chetak helicopter, three services bought the advanced light helicopter. So they buy a common drone, all the paramilitary buy drones, uh, the Coast Guard and the BSF get drones. And also, I mean, why not give one to Delhi police so it can make traffic a bit easier in this fine city of ours. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is there. But then add on the South Africans who essentially supply to Angola, Mozambique, Namibia, Botswana, right. and the Brazilians who supply in South America. You would have an economy of scale of maybe 5,000, 10,000 drones, right? Wow, well, okay. And that is the... Easy, simple stuff. You can make a lot of money out of it and you can improve your security. It, look, along the Himalayas, you can't really fly helicopters. It's not easy to do. You need a heavier aircraft. Along the India-Pakistan border, it's a lot easier to patrol with a drone than it is to patrol on foot. So I think you have to look at realistic projects. The strategic uh, inventory has to be domestically developed and kept away from the prying eyes of people who want to know what your capabilities are. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's cheaper to buy abroad. I'll, I'll give you the example of the AK-203. Right. I've been reading reports that they're saying that a domestically manufactured one will be the same price as three purchased from the Russians. Okay. okay. Now, as a joke, I bought an AK-47 in the United States a mm -hmm. few years ago when the rupee was 40 to the dollar. So it cost me 12,000 rupees for an AK-47, Romanian one. Mm -hmm. India could buy those anywhere in the world. And some countries make good ones, like the Finns, but that's over-engineered. But you can buy a Bulgarian one. There's an Indian company that's actually done a collaboration with that. If you want to have fun, you can approach the North Koreans and see how they react to that one. Oh, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. it is, I, I always believe in uh, pulling people's legs. So on some things which you need quickly, buy abroad. Some things which the private sector can give you, go for it. And on big ticket items that you want to develop, go with international partners. I'll just give one example. There's all these six generation fighter aircraft projects. Uh, don't go into the one with the British and the Japanese because the Japanese invariably sanction India when it tests nuclear weapons. They did that in 74, they did that in 98. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a Franco-German one. You might want to do that one. Get in on the ground floor. The Spanish are talking of getting in. The Russian one, the Indian Air Force won't do because it burnt its fingers with the Sukhoi 57. The American one, you won't be let through the door. Mm -hmm. So find a partner. You may be a junior partner in it, but you will end up with a sixth generation fighter. Well, that, that's you know, a very uh, fascinating insight into things we could do. You know, I have a whole bunch of questions that I really have wanted to ask you, sure. but we seem to be running out of time. Sure. But uh, whenever you're here next, okay. I hope you can take time out for us again because I would Absolutely. like to save some of my questions for you Absolutely. again. Absolutely. So I look and forward to seeing you again and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And next time, ask me about sports and politics. I'll do that okay. too. All I'll right. do that too. Thank you. That was Dr. Amit Gupta, a renowned security and strategic affairs analyst, among other things, talking to us and sharing his insights about what the lessons are from the war in Ukraine, the war in uh, the Middle East as well as Atman Nirbharta and for which he had some really interesting insights. 
I do hope you enjoyed this particular episode and I look forward to seeing you again the next time. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you.